Whatever the scope of our current capacity, may the scope of our motivation always be the Mahayana, the great scope, Bodhicitta. And so in particular, we meditate on the 12 links of dependent arising, because as the Tantra requested by Sabahu says, the path of dependent arising destroys ignorance. The Rice Seedling Sutra states that when you understand dependent arising well, you put an end to all bad views and take as their object the beginning, the end, or the present, Nagarjuna said, this dependent arising is the profound treasure in the storehouse of the conqueror's speech. And so bringing into your mind, however clearly you can, the image of the wheel of life. Held in the mouth and claws of Yama, the Lord of Death. Shakyamuni Buddha outside, pointing the way to liberation. And so there's a story from the basis of discipline that it was this custom of the excellent pair, Shariputra and Modgalyama, during the time of the Buddha, to travel to the five kinds of beings. They would go there, and when they returned to earth, or to Jampuvipa, in our realm, they would talk about the sufferings of these types of beings, telling monks and nuns, telling lay men and lay women, what it was like in different realms, different universes. But among some of the followers, there lived people that disdained pure conduct. The followers brought them before this excellent pair. And Shariputra and Modgalyama instructed them in the accounts of the sufferings of other realms. And as a result of this instruction, they came to delight in pure conduct and were brought to higher understanding as well. And then the teacher, the Buddha, seeing this, questioned Ananda, who informed him of the reasons. Whereupon the Buddha said, Because there will not always be teachers like these, excellent pair, make a painting in the gatehouse, of a five-part wheel of cyclic existence, around the circle, around the circumference of which are the twelve dependent arising in both forward and reverse progressions. Then the wheel of existence was then drawn. It's been existent since the time of the Buddha. And there was another occasion where a painting of the Buddha was to be sent to King Udrayana. And before it was sent, the twelve dependent arisings in forward and reverse progressions were written in verse at the bottom. The king memorized this, and then at dawn, sitting with legs crossed and body straight, concentrated his attention upon virtue. By focusing on the two processes, he achieved the sublime state of an Arya. And so people have been meditating on the wheel 
in order to break the wheel for thousands of years. And so just let this infuse your motivation and you're determined to understand. And so we think of the top of the ring, of the outside ring, of the wheel of life, held in the mouth of Yama, the Lord of Death, who is really impermanence, his two arms, karma and disturbing emotions, his three eyes representing past, present and future. His five skull crown represents the five afflictions. His four fangs, the four maras. And so while there are sentient beings who have become evil through strong habituation, the only thing really trapping us in this way, in this monstrous form, is our own karma and disturbing emotions. This is the yama. And so picture ignorance, which is displayed as a blind person. And this represents the ignorance of two types, confusion about karma and its effects, and confusion about the meaning of reality. And so if you have ignorance about cause and effect, you accumulate the actions for a negative rebirth in the lower realms. And if you're only confused about the meaning of reality, you still accumulate late negative karma, but it can project you to the upper realms. And so our conclusion is, at the very least, we need to understand cause and effect so that we're not reborn in the lower realms, so we stop hurting others and ourselves. But if we really want to escape samsara altogether, we must realize the wisdom. Direct perception into the nature of reality the emptiness of inherent existence. Depicted next is karmic formations in the form of a potter making various sized pots, showing that karma has different sizes or weights. And these karmic formations or compositional activity come directly from this ignorance. And even if it's good karma that we create, it still projects rebirth in samsara because of ignorance. In order to stop karmic formations, we must directly realize emptiness. The seed of those karmic formations is placed on our primary consciousness. 
And there are six types of consciousness, but here what carries karma is the fundamental consciousness. The consciousness of the lifetime in which this negative karma happens is the consciousness of the causal period, while that which enters the birthplace and miserable realms in the future, in dependence on the causal period consciousness, is called consciousness of the effect period. And consciousness is often depicted as a monkey. And then there is name and form, usually depicted as a ship with people, the way our five aggregates go from life to life. And even in realms where there is no form, there is the seed for the aggregate of form. Or in the case of beings like Bardo beings, a very subtle wind. And then come the six sources depicted as an empty house. If you are born from a womb, four sources, the eyes, ears, nose, and tongue are formed through th further development of, quote, name, consciousness. The physical and mental sources, though, actually exist from the time of the fertilized ovum. There are other variations if you're born spontaneously from eggs. This is talking about womb birth. But whenever it is that the six sources are established, the experiencer has been created because the particulars of the body have been formed. which makes it possible for there to be contact, which is sometimes depicted as a couple sitting together, kissing, or sometimes copulating, which is when the sensory object, sensory faculty, and consciousness come together, the meeting of the inside with the outside, the dualism, of course, another symptom of grasping at inherent existence. So when these three come together, you distinguish three types of objects as attractive, unattractive, or neutral. Your mental factor of discrimination labels. And then feeling arises corresponding to the contacts discrimination. And there occur three sorts of feelings, pleasant, painful, and neutral. And feeling is depicted as the arrow entering the eye of a person. And this is not by accident. If there was an arrow in your eye, it would be almost impossible to ignore. Feeling is one of our most dominant experiences. We are so used to thinking if it is unpleasant, then necessarily there should be aversion, anger, irritation, rage. If there is a pleasant feeling, then there should be attachment, craving, grasping, hunger and need, desire. If it is neutral, 
so natural to give rise to further ignorance or indifference, boredom and vagueness. We even mistake the feelings to be the responses when they are two separate events. But feeling like the arrow in an eye, very hard to ignore. So we don't ignore it. We break the associations through logic and reasoning, through mindfulness, In terms of daily life, this is the place of our work. If we can back it up a step and try not to come into contact with things that trigger negative states of mind, excellent. If we can re-educate discrimination, excellent. But on a minute-to-minute -minute basis, what we're working with is feeling. Becoming more and more aware of the space between feeling and response. So that we retake the power to choose. But without breaking these associations between the feeling and the response, without logic and mindfulness, it turns into craving so easily. Craving not to be separated from pleasant feelings, craving to be separated from painful feelings. If there were no ignorance, craving would not occur. And it's usually depicted as a person drinking alcohol or someone handing someone else a glass of alcohol. And think of how we become intoxicated when craving is present. How much harder it is to make good choices. How easy it is to turn into grasping. And grasping is usually depicted as a monkey or a person grabbing fruit from a tree. One after the other, not even enjoying the one it has. Sometimes one in its mouth and one in its hand. holding on to what we want, holding on to views, holding on to a wrong idea of ethics, holding on to assertions that there is a self just as it seems, this being the most dangerous. And then depicted as potential existence a pregnant woman. In the past, compositional activity or karmic formations infused your consciousness with latent propensities, karmic seeds. Then when they're nurtured by craving and grasping, they become empowered to bring forth a subsequent existence. And then there is birth, depicted as a woman giving birth, although it's referring actually to consciousness, 
initially entering one or another of the four types of rebirth. And then there is aging and death, an old person carrying a corpse on their back. Aging is the maturation and transformation of the mental and physical aggregates. Death is the casting aside of the aggregates continuum, particularly the body. And so how do we understand the way these actually function within lives? There are instances of these all throughout a life, but the fully qualified form is actually talking about rebirth and cyclic existence over a minimum of two lives. So there are the projecting factors, ignorance, compositional activity or karmic formations, and consciousness. There are the projected factors, name and form, six sources, contact and feeling. Then there are the actualizing factors, craving, grasping, potential existence. And what are actualized, our birth, aging, and death. And so we're talking about two cycles of causality. The characteristics of the true sufferings that are the effects of projection differ from those that are the effects of actualization. Consciousness of the effect period, name and form, six sources and contact, feeling, are dormant at the time of projection. Since they have not actually been established, they will only become suffering in the future. This is what we're making now. However, the latter, birth, aging, and death, are situations in which the suffering has been actualized, and hence are suffering in this lifetime. So the point of all this is to help us understand two cycles of cause and effect The effect taking rebirth has two causes, projecting causes and causes that actualize that which has been projected.
And so understand it simply by just thinking of the two factors, craving, which is an actualizing factor, and feeling, which gives rise to this craving, are not in the same sequence of dependent arising. The feeling that gives rise to craving is an effect of some other sequence of dependent arising. And so leaving aside the appearance of true existence, even relative existence has an extra layer of confusion on top of it. We really think that what we're feeling now is about now. And so we blame or praise what's happening now and try to create more and less of what's happening now when in fact we need to look back into our own mind, exhaust and purify negative karma, reinforce and develop positive karma. And whenever possible, remember emptiness. It's possible for countless eons to go by between projecting and projected factors. It's possible for projected factors to be actualized the very next lifetime with no intervening lifetimes. The nuances of karma are far more complex than we could ever imagine. But the conclusion we come to is the same as when we had a very simple understanding. If we want happiness, we need to practice positive actions. If we don't want suffering, we need to prevent negative actions. But our reasons for these and our understanding of these become deeper and deeper and more nuanced the more we meditate on these cycles. Dedication. Thank you.